My name's Wes. I'm with uh, GFK Lug out of Grand Forks, North Dakota. And we brought out kind of a history of military aviation display to, to this event. This is our first time displaying at, at World War Brick, so we're kind of excited to, to bring a bunch of stuff out. Uh, starting off here, we have a World War I display, which is kind of a, a fictional scene. Uh, we call it the final match of 1918. Uh, so it's basically after the armistice of World War I. Um, if both sides got together to do something other than fight, what would it be? And we kind of thought, well, a football match was, uh, was appropriate for that. Um, so, you know, all the planes uh, were all things that I started building over, over the last few years. And then the hangar, we were kind of expanding the airfield and just wanted kind of a, a more fun way to display it. Um, it's a little bit non-violence for, for kids that are in our area, but also educational kind of as to the aircraft and the sides that, that fought in, uh, in the Great War. So I love this because it's very unique material, so we don't see a lot of World War I builds, especially World War I kind of uh, air, air forces here as well. So take us through some of these planes that you depicted here. Yeah, so starting over here, we have uh, an RAF SA5, SE-5A, uh, which was kind of like the Spitfire of World War I. It was a very effective fighter, but not very well known, not as well known as the Sopwith Camel, which is kind of in the, the back hangar there. Um, then we have the, the Newport 28, which was actually uh, the United States' first fighter aircraft ever. Um, didn't last too long in World War I before it was replaced by the French SPAD. Uh, but still has a, a fitting place in, in American aviation history. Um, then we have a Newport 17, which is behind it, which is one of uh, France's most famous uh, fighter aircraft of the war, and actually some of uh, the Escadrille Lafayette, which is um, an American squadron in the French Air Force, flew, some of our uh, fighter pilots flew that uh, before the Americans even got involved. So they volunteered to, to go over and, and flew that aircraft um, on behalf of the Allies in World War I. Then we have Sopwith Camel, which is probably one of the most famous aircraft uh, of World War I. Um, and that one uh, is in our, our Bessonneau hangar there in the back, which uh, we built a frame for. Uh, you know, we're okay at building Lego, but not so good at sewing, so kind of had to figure out a way to build the tent around it. Um, but yeah, the structure inside is, is pretty cool, and we like to... Uh, we want to build some more of those eventually, so we have, we have a crew building another one back there. Hopefully we'll have a few more uh, by this time next year. But yeah, then on the other side we have uh, some of the German planes. So in the back there we have a, a Fokker Eindecker. It's one of, one of the last monoplanes of the war. Um, and that's uh, pretty recognizable from the Eindeckers fought really from the beginning of the war through end of 1916. Um, so it was a very potent aircraft initially that, that caused uh, the British and the Americans to really catch up with what uh, Germans were doing and try and outpace the technology. It really drove a lot of innovation in military aviation early on. Uh, then we have an Albatross D3. Uh, the Albatross, actually that's the first airplane I ever built um, uh, when I started building aircraft in general. So uh, the D3 was uh, again a very popular aircraft. That's uh, the first aircraft that um, the Red Baron, Manfred von Richthofen, flew. Uh, before moving on to the, the triplane, the DR-1, which we have here, uh, a menacing looking DR-1 um, triplane, which I think is probably the most famous German aircraft, at least, uh, of World War I. Um, and yeah, obviously its, uh, it's reputation kind of precedes it as far as maneuverability and lethality. So. I love all that. Yeah, seeing a lot. Both sides represented very nicely here from World War One. What was your research like for kind of looking into the history of some of these aircraft as you were working on these? Yeah, a lot of research. I'm, I've always been interested in World War One. I, I, I grew up a little bit overseas as well, so always fascinated me. Um, so every aircraft I built, each starting with the Albatross, you know, I put a lot of time into researching, uh, you know, not just the dimensions, but also the capability and the pilots that flew them. Uh, to try and pick out schemes that kind of fit with uh, with the motif here. Um, and yeah, every aircraft, uh, the Newport 28 is the latest one that I built. Um, and that one, I actually didn't know at the time that that was our, you know, America's first fighter aircraft. So it was very interesting researching that. Some of America's first aces flew that. Um, and it was just been a, it has an interesting history, although very short history. Um, but all the aircraft here, I mean, they all have very brief, um, very brief history in the conflict, like not more than a year, year and a half when they were really effective. Uh, but each one was a, a massive technological leap forward um, and really outclassed the aircraft that came before it, you know, just the previous year, uh, which, was, which I always found was pretty interesting in World War I. So.
Fantastic work. We can keep moving forward in the timeline then. And what do we have next? Yeah, so next we have a few World War II aircraft. Um, and the World War II aircraft here and then the, the Falklands aircraft on the end. Um, I wanted to build in a little bit smaller scale. Uh, so these are all 155 scale, whereas the World War I stuff is all minifig scale. Uh, the reason for that is I like to build base plates, basically little dioramas for each of them. Um, so all of these aircraft have their own little displays that, uh, that you know, sit on the shelf normally. Um, but yeah, up top flying we have a, a Spitfire uh, Mark II in the back, which is fighting a, a Messerschmitt ME109 here in front. Um, kind of classic Battle of Britain uh, aircraft. And then behind or underneath that, I guess, we have a, a Hawker Hurricane. Um, the Hurricane was actually the most prominent or the most successful aircraft in the Battle of Britain, even though the Spitfire takes a lot of the, the fame away from it. And then we have a P-51C in front. Um, that particular aircraft represents Lopes Hope III, which was uh, restored actually very close to where I live now in North Dakota. Uh, so we see that one at the Dakota Territory Air Museum quite a bit. So. So some of these you've actually been able to see in person then and kind of get an idea of what they were like? Yeah, virtually all of them I've seen in one way or another. Um, Lopes Hope is probably the only one I've seen fly and up close, you know, personally. Um, you'll see that if you go to Oshkosh, it's, it's flying air shows all over the country right now. Uh, but it's a beautiful airplane, beautiful rep restoration, you know, in this area. Um, so I just wanted to make a, a smaller version of it, so to speak. So, Fantastic. What do we have next then? All right, so next we have, uh, this is a collaborative display um, for the Happy Hooligans. And the Happy Hooligans is the 119th uh, fighter wing of the North Dakota Air National Guard. Um, this unit served from 1946 to 2006, if I remember right. So 60-year history, all in the fighter interceptor role. They had no other role other than to intercept uh, Soviet aircraft at the time, you know, coming over from Canada or something like that. Um, and the aircraft here is kind of an homage to that. So we have uh, an F-51 in front, which is the first aircraft they ever flew. And then the F-102, which um, I've actually never seen one in Lego before, so that was kind of a challenge to create, uh, was the first supersonic aircraft, su supersonic fighter aircraft that uh, was in the North Dakota Air National Guard. And then the, uh, well, it probably goes without saying, but the F-4 Phantom, uh, always a popular aircraft. Um, really, you know, great capabilities of that airframe, and that was only uh, superseded by the F-16, which was uh, actually an air interceptor variant of uh, the F-16. Just all sole purpose was to intercept uh, enemy aircraft. And then behind that, it was probably been the most popular thing that we brought out here. Actually, it was this hangar. Um, the hangar was designed and built by one of our lug members, Jamie Lunsky, um, and he. We had a lot of leftover railroad track, so you can see pretty much all of the the cross beams and everything inside of it is built around railroad track. Um, we originally built the outside with doors, but eventually switched it to windows because it just looks so much cooler to be able to look inside the hangar, um, especially you know putting in different uh, aircraft inside and stuff like that. So. Yeah, it's always cool to see large uh, curved Lego structures like that. It is, yeah. It's it's kind of a rare shape in Lego, so we wanted to. He came up with that design, and you know it works perfectly for like an old-fashioned hangar. Um, so yeah, we really wanted to flesh it out, and make it full size, and yeah, it's a, it's a good great part of our uh, our display every year as well. Towards the end here, we have uh, a Falklands 40 display. So. The, this is the, uh, the 40th anniversary of the Falklands War, which was between uh, the British and, and the Argentine uh, Air Force and Navy in this case. Um, so we built a few smaller aircraft. These are the same scale as the World War II Warbirds, actually. Um, these aircraft represent some of the aircraft that fought in that conflict. Um, so we wanted to, to recognize, uh, really on both sides, there's extreme bravery. Uh, amongst the pilots, very low-level flying, you know, bombing ships on the, on the side of the Argentines, uh, potent air defenders and uh, the Harriers uh, that, that basically had to go 7,000 miles uh, to get from Britain to the Falkland Islands down in, uh, off the, the very tip of South America. Uh, so it's a pretty extraordinary conflict, um, not one you see often represented in LEGO. Um, since it was the 40th anniversary, we really wanted to uh, honor that and represent it, um, you know, at a at a show like this. So, yeah. no, I th I think I, I like the the unique source material, like we were talking about with World War One earlier as well. So you've got kind of nice dioramas for each of these. Take us through some of the details you were able to include there. 
Yeah, so up front here we have a, this is a Sea Harrier FRS-1. Uh, the Sea Harrier was undefeated in air-to-air -air combat in the Falklands War. So it kind of has that, that legendary status that like the Spitfire had in the Battle of Britain and stuff like that. Um, but they had um, very small aircraft carriers and even a container ship that they were able to load these Harriers on and ship them, you know, thousands and thousands of miles uh, into the South Atlantic. Um, and they didn't know how it would perform. It had never really been tested in combat before, uh, but the aircraft served brilliantly. Uh, you know, a lot of air-to-air -air kills. And then uh, the GR3 actually behind that is just the ground attack version of the FRS-1. So it's, it's the RAF version of it. Um, and that one also took part in a conflict. Uh, the RAF, that was their, their only contribution to the ground attack uh, at, in the Falklands War. And just like the, the Sea Harrier, you know, it did uh, extremely admirably in that role, especially in the, the harsh conditions, uh, you know, in the South Atlantic at the time. Um, and then in the back there, that's actually Argentina's only native-built combat aircraft. So that's a, an FMA Pucara. Um, and the Pucaras, you know, were used for ground attack, kind of like a, a turboprop A-10, if you, know, if you want to think of it that way. Um, this scene kind of depicts, well, two things really. First, um, the, the airfield was bombed by Vulcan bombers uh, in the Black Buck raids, um, and it took out some of the Picaras that were on the ground in Port Stanley. Um, and then we also have some raiders there. Um, really, at the early days of the war, the Special Air Service infiltrated the airfields and sabotaged a lot of these aircraft uh, while they were still on the ground, so they couldn't surprise, uh, provide air support to uh, the Argentine troops, um, and that really led to some of the success of the, the British uh, taking back the Falkland Islands, really. So, And last but not least, in front, we have a, an A-4 Skyhawk. Um, the A-4 was obviously a U.S.-built fighter uh, that was sold to Argentina, uh, and at the onset of the war, Argentina actually had an aircraft carrier. Um, the 25th of May uh, is what it was called, and it had um, A-4 Skyhawks on it that uh, were, you know, capable of, of ground attack and ship attack and air-to-air -air strikes. So it was kind of a major threat. Um, but actually, due to that ship suffering malfunction and also the sinking of a, a, an Argentine cruiser not long before it was to see action, they actually withdrew that aircraft carrier. But the A-4 still saw action taking off from land, um, Rio Grande, and still being able to attack the islands and the shipping in Falkland Sound and, and around the Falkland Islands. So it was a very, very potent aircraft, actually sunk many British ships uh, during the conflict just by simple dumb bombing at, at low level. Um, so very, very brave pilots on both sides that uh, took part in this conflict. Um, and just, yeah, really wanted to represent that and capture that um, and you know bring some of that history to a show like this as well. Right, no, that's all fascinating stuff. So I really appreciate you bringing it out. And then at the end here, what do we have? Yeah, at the end, this is a kind of a smaller scene, just uh, depicting the Battle of Mogadishu, so uh, Black Hawk Down fame, um, which is a great book, obviously a great movie, but it's a really great story. It's a story of camaraderie um, with, uh, within the U.S. Army between the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, U.S. Army Rangers uh, that took part in the battle. So we have a, a crashed Black Hawk here that uh, actually was shot down uh, in downtown Mogadishu, um, and then we have some rescuers that are coming in on, uh, on what we call Little, little Bird Helicopters. Uh, so these AH-6s in the front and the MH-6 in the back were able to insert Special Operations Troops De Delta Force you know, in the city to be able to secure those crash scenes and you know, provide uh, air support and things like that uh, during the conflict. I'm a helicopter pilot myself, so it was kind of, you know, it's always fascinated me. I started flying right about the time that movie came out, um, and then read the book, and read the, the book Night Stalkers by Mike Durant, who's one of the pilots that was shot down, actually, in Mogadishu. Uh, great stories, you know, really interesting flying uh, from a technical side. So just wanted to, you know, the, the Blackhawk is actually a Brickmania Blackhawk, um, and then the AH-6 and MH-6 are, are custom builds. That, uh, that we may just kind of, again, honor that, that, uh, that flying skill and that courage uh, during that conflict. Yeah, once again, excellent work throughout the whole timeline here. I just love how much research you've done and how much thought you've put into each of these builds here. So do you all have any plans to like, expand on this, maybe add other aircraft to continue with this kind of theme? Yeah, absolutely. We have, uh, this is actually kind of a, 
a fraction of the aircraft we have. We just kind of brought out the stuff that we thought fit best or that we, we found most thematic. Uh, but definitely like the Falkland stuff in particular, there's aircraft that, were, that are missing from this. Uh, we'd like to expand more on the helicopter aviation side, um, you know, show different different types of, of helicopter aviation because that's, that's also kind of a rare thing outside the military, you know, what other jobs do they do. So yeah, definitely, and the World War One stuff as well. We have quite a few uh, aircraft that we didn't bring out to this that uh, that we'd love to expand that whole airfield side of it.